The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Could the United States descend into civil war? It's a bold thesis put forward by author Stephen Marsh, and we'll debate it here tonight. Then, why it matters that we understand that COVID-19 is airborne. It's Tuesday, January 11th, and that's all ahead on The Agenda. You no doubt saw some of the coverage last week of the first anniversary of the events of January 6, 2021. Many of us watched in astonishment a year ago as the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. came under attack. Someone who probably wasn't surprised was Canadian author Stephen Marsh, who has been predicting a second American civil war for some time. He characterizes what he thinks is coming in his new book, The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future, and with that, we welcome Stephen Marsh back to our program from Seton Village in Ontario's capital city. Stephen, it's good to see you again. How are you doing? Good to see you, too. Let's start by me putting to you a quote that is in your book. This is from retired U.S. Army Colonel Peter Mansour, who said, It would not be like the first civil war with armies maneuvering on the battlefield, he says. I think it would very much be a free-for-all, neighbor-on-neighbor, based on beliefs and skin colors and religion, and it would be horrific. Well, that certainly sets the scene. And my first question for you is, how much, in your view, did Donald Trump's presidency contribute to your sense of an impending civil war? Uh, very little, to be honest. Uh, you know, I think one of the aspects of this book is trying to get below the sort of horse race politics uh, that dominates coverage. You know, what Marjorie Taylor Greene's Twitter feed is saying or what Ted Cruz did or didn't do on Fox News. And Donald Trump, of course, was the, the master of that kind of, um, you know, uh, aggressive politics. You know, the trends here are really deep. Um, you know, I think the thing I found really hardest to explain, particularly to liberal Americans, is that I believe everything in this book would have happened if Hillary Clinton had been elected in 2016. OK, that's a fascinating insight. But I do. Let me put it this way. I'm, I'm a lot older than you. And I was alive for the assassinations of Martin Indeed. Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. You don't have to rub it in. But anyway, I, I do remember when <laughs> political assassination, <laughs> when political assassination seemed um, far too frequent. It was horrific. And yet America did not descend into a civil war at that time, even though it sure looked like it might happen. Why do you think what we're seeing today could lead to worse? Well, the 60s were very dramatic, and there were, of course, major conflicts. And, you know, 140 cities burned after the assassination of MLK. And political assassination is very common in American history. You know, you know, basically one out of 11 presidents have been assassinated, a little less now. Uh, but, you know, to compare that, Britain has only had one prime minister assassinated. So, you know, as one secret servant, as Ser secret service agent said to me, uh, assassination is part of the political process in the United States. Um, what's changed now? What's different from the '60s is that the institutions are no longer prepared to deal with the fallout from violence. So, you don't have the same legitimacy of the political institutions. You don't have the same legitimacy in the legal institutions. If you take an event like Watergate. Uh, in hindsight, that was evidence of the system working. You had a press that investigated corruption. You had a, an audience that believed the press. You had politicians who then needed to respond to the mass sense of corruption. And then from that, you had you know political legal action from both parties. You, none of that would happen today. Uh, that's why America is so much more vulnerable. It's because its institutions are in decline. Hmm. Now, it seems to me back in the day, the biggest cleavage in the United States, or one of them anyway, was sort of left versus right. And today, it feels to me, and you can tell me if you agree or disagree, it seems to me the biggest cleavage hmm. is sane versus insane. Does that make civil war more likely? Yes, but, you know, it's really important to remember that your sane and the other side's sane are totally opposites, right? They also regard uh, the insanity f as taking over, but from the other side. Uh, you, you have people who are in complete disagreement about basic facts, about the basic role of government, about what freedom means, 
Uh, and ultimately, you know, what this civil war is about or will be about is about the meaning of America. And that struggle kind of is permanent. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's not a debate over policy. It's a debate about very, very fundamental questions about the nature of you know, the country itself. We talked a second ago about the role of assassination in American political history, and I do want to follow up on that a bit right now. And I have to say, you, you did write a chapter in this book that basically describes the characteristics that you believe the next presidential assassin will have and how he will do mm -hmm. it, and it is a he, as you suggest. And, okay, why'd you put all that in the book? Let's start there. Well, I mean, what I wanted to capture through these imagined scenarios is how, uh, you know, it's a way of sort of giving a hook to various different kind of abstract categories. So one of those categories is hyperpartisanship, where, you know, Americans don't want to don't want their children to marry people of other parties. They the hatred really drives um, engagement, like hatred is the number one way that politics works in America now. Uh, and that hatred bubbles up at the same time as you have uh, the rise of what the experts call uh, stochastic terrorism, which is, you know, self self generating terrorists. Uh, and 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 so it was a way of kind of capturing that reality. Also, you know, I think the, the really important part of that book is not that uh, a presidential assassination is possible. That's always been true in American history. Uh, I think what it shows is that uh, if a president were to be assassinated, it would be almost impossible for there to be national unity around it. Half the country would probably regard it as a good thing, and the other half probably wouldn't. And, you know, that when you think about the 60s, like when JFK was assassinated, it was genuinely treated as a national catastrophe, and that, that could not be said about the presidencies of Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Barack Obama, for that matter. And no, and in fact, the same thing happened, uh, whatever it was, 41, almost 42 years ago, when the attempt was made on Ronald Reagan's life. And it didn't matter if you were a Republican or a Democrat at that time. Everybody was mortified by that instance. But I, I guess what I'm getting at with the question is, you do go into some detail about why you think the assassin will do what he will do, how he will do what he will do. And I just wonder if you had any nervousness about putting that much specificity about, after all, something that is a rather taboo topic out there for public display. Why would it be bad to, pr to produce uh, models? that like, Those are models that are drawn from the best available models of terrorism. I don't think confronting the possibility of that reality can be negative. I mean, putting your head in the sand when it comes to America is... Uh, you know, this is not a good option. This is not going to lead to better outcomes. It's not gonna, like suddenly pre pretending that there isn't this violence out there is not going to diminish the violence at all. What do you think the assassin's motive would be? Well, I, I mean, you know, it would be political loathing of a really profound way. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the book goes into real specifics of the psychological characteristics that tend to make up terrorists. Um, senses of loss, senses of personal grandeur. They actually have incredibly strong models for the psychological makeup of um, assassins and, and, and political rioters and so on. And, uh, you know, it was just an attempt to recreate what that would look like. Like, you know, they have the model. I sort of kind of put flesh on the bones and make it feel like what it would actually look like if it happened. Uh, all right. Thank you for setting the table for the discussion to come, Stephen, because we are going to bring some other voices into our conversation right now. They are all joining us from the American Capitol. So let's welcome Julie Ronsky, who is a professor at the University of Mississippi, specializing in political psychology and American politics. Nate Hockman, who's the ISI fellow at the National Review and Novak fellow at the Fund for American Studies. And Dylan Matthews, who's a senior correspondent at the news and opinion website Vox. And we welcome all you three as well to our conversation about Stephen Marsh's new book, um, of which I'd like to read another excerpt to propel us to the next area of our conversation. Here's what Stephen writes. America is becoming two Americas, Americas that hate each other, that don't speak to each other. No one occupies the middle ground anymore. Everyone has separated into one side or the other, one party or the other, no matter what they may claim. Okay, I just want to get the three of you generally speaking on the thesis of this book, which is basically the next civil war is coming. And if we want to avoid it, there are some steps pretty significant that need to be taken. Julie, can you comment on that, please? Hi, yes. Yeah, so first, thank you for having me on the show. Um, 
So I want to draw on some of my own research that looks at partisan divisions in the United States and how we think about partisans and how we think about fellow citizens as being either American or un-American. And a lot of my research finds that there is a small but non-trivial uh, significant portion of Americans who think about their fellow citizen, citizens, especially out party citizens as un-American, maybe around the uh, magnitude of 15 to 20%. So this is somewhat disturbing that we're thinking about people that technically are citizens as these un-American foreign threats. And that's fairly dangerous to having national community, especially in a time of a national pandemic like COVID-19. So I am definitely concerned that there are these divisions set up. We see a lot of partisan sorting where each political party is increasingly characterized by one set of people that is defined by race, religion, geography, gender, uh, values, and ideology. So we are seeing the two parties are very different across the aisle in terms of who they represent, what they believe in, and where they live. So in some ways, a lot of on the ground, the public opinion and the partisan composition of America really does align with Stephen Marsh's premise. I take your point on all that, but but the, the, I guess the definition of civil war that Stephen uses in his book is that we are going to at some point see hundreds, if not thousands, of people killed every day because taken to its no, logical not extent. Every not every day? How often, Stephen? No, no. The, the technical marker for a civil war is a thousand uh, combatant deaths a year. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Significant that's, that's what an insurgent conflict looks like. Yeah, it's not thousands of deaths a day. All right. In which that's case, Julie, can choice. you imagine that happening in your country? I mean, in some ways, aren't we already there? Hmm. How do we define combatant? How do we define violence? When do school shootings or mass shootings or homicides count into that threshold? You know, as Stephen called it, he called it a stochastic uh fighting these kind of uncoordinated individual attacks. So if we start relabeling or reconceptualizing a lot of the violence we already see in America in these terms, we might actually be fairly close to Stephen's threshold of that 1,000 deaths. So in some ways it is definitional, but it's also in some ways because it's not coordinated, it might already be appearing in ways that are natural. So say something like January 6th, might already be at that threshold. And it doesn't take a lot of people, you know, if it only takes a thousand or 10,000 people to have violence to meet this threshold, we might be there. That's a fraction of the American population. No, that's a good point to, to put on the record here is that it's not, if, if there is a next civil war, uh, it's not gonna be like the blue and the gray of uh, the 1860s where people line up and start shooting at each other with muskets. It's going to be uh, for the 21st century. And I guess, Nate, uh, I want to get you on the record now as to what your view is of the thesis being put forward by Stephen Marsh. Uh, well, look, I agree with uh, Stephen's take that institutional breakdown has a lot to do with the divisions in America today. And I think things are getting really bad in America. Whether or not we are on our way to a civil war, I think, is certainly uh, open for debate. I don't think we're at a point where we're at a civil war yet. January 6, for example, was less than 10 deaths. Uh, the BLM riots the, the summer before were, you know, somewhere in the in the ballpark of about 50 deaths, although there's a lot of destruction. So we're seeing an enormous amount of civic breakdown, certainly, and we're seeing a, a loss of trust in our institutions. That could go a lot of different ways, though. And you've seen countries that go through this process before without descending fully into civil war. So I think I'm a little slightly more optimistic, if not naive, um, than, than Stephen is. I would just add, though, that I think the breakdown in confidence in our institutions, the, the context that needs to be added there, is a large part of that is the result of the behavior of the people who run our institutions themselves. You know, there's an, a lot of talk in DC circles, for example, um, that about sort of the, the problem with a declining trust in institutions. There's not as much self-reflection as I'd like to see from the actual people who are running our institutions about exactly what their role was in declining trust. I mean, I think that has to be a large part of the conversation. The divisions between Americans today aren't just left-right. They are an insular upper class of about the upper one-third of American society and middle America. Uh, and I think that 
those divisions have been exacerbated by people at the top behaving in ways that alienate middle Americans and then turning around and lecturing middle Americans about not having confidence in their institutions. So part of these divisions, I think, have to do with the fact that the institutional authorities that we traditionally look to as a source of expertise, a source of authority on any number of things, have uh, ruined their own legitimacy with a large swath of Americans. And uh, any sort of path to national renewal and healing has to take that into account. Okay, Dylan, let me get you on the record as to whether you think America could be headed for another civil war. Um, I don't find civil war to be a, a useful term for the kind of civic conflict that we have in the United States right now, um, especially because of the specific historical context in the United States. Um, often in these discussions, people like Stephen or um, uh, the political scientist Barbara Walter, who has, has been very vocal in, in raising alarms about a potential second civil war, well, be careful to state that they're talking about something like an insurgent conflict, something like a uh, thousand deaths per year, as, as Stephen said. Uh, Walter has, has drawn analogies to something like the Troubles uh, in Northern Ireland. In an American political context, uh, people understand the word civil war to mean something rather specific, which is sort of armies on battlefields mobilized by states. Uh, the first American civil war killed 2.5% of the American population. The equivalent today would be something like 7 million Americans uh, being killed in armed conflict. Uh, there just isn't evidence to my eyes that enough Americans support violence at that scale that the kind of breakdown is so sectional uh, and regional as it was in the 1860s. Um, if you look at a, a province like Quebec, uh, there's no analog in the United States for the kind of sovereigntist nationalist movement of, of CAQ or, or PQ. Uh, there's no Californian sovereigntist movement. There's no Texas sovereigntist movement. And most of the cleavages are internal to states. It's Austin versus rural Texas. It's uh, San Francisco versus Humboldt County. Um, and so am I concerned about low level violence assassinations? Yes, though I think it's important, uh, as you said, Steve, uh, to point out that in the 1960s, sort of the absolute rates of those things were much higher. Uh, and while the deaths of people like JFK were mourned as tragedies. Uh, the deaths of people like Malcolm X or Martin Luther King Jr. were not universally mourned as tragedies and were celebrated in certain quarters. Um, so I don't think the situation is as bad as it was in the mid-1960s, the early 1970s, when you were averaging about five mostly non-lethal bombings a day in the United States, mostly from, from political groups. Uh, but I, I certainly don't want to diminish the importance of polarization in American society right now. I just think that sort of alarmism and use of the term civil war specifically in an American context is, is not uh, an accurate reflection of the current state of play. Well, Stephen, you've had to defend yourself against the use of the term civil war in the past, and you just heard the word alarmist yeah. used in relation to it. Do you want to defend yourself on that? Well, I mean, I've been called alarmist uh, in a lot of uh, you know, the, from the very beginning, like, you know, and I'm still called alarmist today. But, you know, I mean, the thing is, the unimaginable keeps happening. Like, you, you would say if you'd gone back five years ago and said there'll be tanks on the streets of Washington on July 4th, no one would have believed you. But that happened. Um, I mean, I was on your show saying the militias are coming and being roundly attacked for it and six months before January 6th happened. So, you know, I'm, I'm used to this uh, process. I, I would take... Um, Dylan's point, seriously, though, like, we are talking here about, we're not talking about the Civil War. I don't think anyone is talking about the level of destruction of the first Civil War. We're talking about insurgency, exactly that. It, it is, um, America is so big and so diverse, uh, both in terms of population and in terms of geography, that historical analogs really, in its own history or in anyone else's history, are really hard to get to. And, you know, in the book, I do get at that. Like when you're talking to these military experts about what it would be like to occupy the United States, there's no real model because, you know, no country is like America. No country's ever been like America. Uh, what I'm talking about is large scale political violence. And I, I do think it's correct to fear large scale political violence, like not small amounts. Uh, and, and the inability of the government to create order for it. And, you know, I mean, I would say about the point that, you know, these elites have to take responsibility for their 
uh, for this decline in institutions. That's that's true as far as it goes. Um, you know, I think you, when you see um, the inability to even mourn a, a Capitol police officer uh, who is where they they, they they literally can't get together to mourn somebody who has died protecting them. Uh, when you see, like, from a Canadian point of view, the fact that basic government functions have become ludicrous high-stakes games, like, they, you know, the appointment of diplomats, the, the, the constant flirting around reneging on the debt, which is, you know, just totally insane. And then, you know, the Build Back Better bill, which is essentially a budget. I mean, you know, that's a Wednesday in most mature democracies. Um, <laughs> That that's true, but you know there are real structural problems too here. Like by 2040, uh, you know, the estimates suggest that about 30 percent of the population will control 68 percent of the Senate. Another way of putting that is 50 percent of the population will control 84 percent of the Senate. And already you have a Supreme Court where five out of nine justices were not selected by uh, a, a president who won the popular mandate. And when whenever when they make a decision on abortion, whichever way it goes, half the country will feel it's illegitimate. That's no one's fault. That's that's a problem with structure. And I, I mean, to me, when I when I look at American politics, what I see is not we need better leaders. If only we could get moderate Republicans in. If only we could figure something out. It's more like this system is very antiquated. Mm. It's 240 years old. Jefferson said you should only have a constitution for 19 years. It's time to get another one. Basically. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll talk in a bit about how that might potentially happen. But I wonder, um, Julie, if I can go back to this issue of sane versus insane as part of what led us to this moment. I mean, there, there is a, and I, I can't tell you what the percentage is, but there's a chunk of the Republican Party today that believes that Jewish space lasers started forest fires in California, which adversely affected that state. Now, how did it get to this? So one thing that the political science tells us is that we think about new information and we approach new information through the lenses of the groups and identities we already have. So this means that if you're a Democrat, you're going to look at Democrat and left-leaning news articles and trust them more. If you're a Republican, you're going to look at those elites and those trusted sources and follow those leaders. And again, this might get to the point that uh, was made about the institutions and the elites, that if the elites are polarizing and if the elites are telling people different stories or different aspects of reality, people are going to look at information to defend their identity. You're going to look at information to say, well, if I'm a Republican and my trusted Republican news source tells me this, I'm going to believe it. Okay. St uh, Stephen says in the book, and Nate, I'll bring you in on this. Stephen says in the book that violence could very well start at the hands of, I guess, what might be called the armed militant wing of the Republican Party. What's your view on that? Well, look, I, I know I'm the conservative on the panels, uh, but I, I have to say, I think the problem with uh, the, this discussion and this narrative in, in general is that it is uh, largely one-sided and partisan. I mean, you know, Stephen was talking earlier about the problem with uh, a lack of belief in our institutions, uh, and certainly, lack, uh, you know, not failing to, to celebrate a, a, a fallen Capitol police officer is a big deal. Uh, but there's an entire other side of this equation that's being missed, which is um, the misbehavior of the left-leaning elite. Um, you know, I mean, you have everything from the Kamala Harris, who's now the vice president of the United States, uh, raising bail funds for people who were arrested for violent crimes during um, BLM riots in 2020, to you know people like Anthony Fauci admitting that they that they lied multiple times to uh, Americans about any number of, of things throughout the pandemic, to public health officials. Well, hang on, hang on, Nate. I got to jump in there. I, I I don't recall Anthony Fauci admitting several times that he lied. During that's the not true. Of the pandemic. That's not, that's, actually, well, that's not true. So he he lied about masks. He flip flopped. He apologized for it later. And he told but the New lied? York Times two months Hang ago. Hang on, lied. It, I, I don't know about yes. I don't know about down in Washington, but it, but in Canada, when you use a word like lie, that means that he knowingly he, put out false information for the purposes of deceiving people. Is that Anthony, what we're saying? Anthony Fauci. Anthony Fauci on herd immunity said that Americans weren't ready to hear the actual herd immunity numbers. He said, originally, I said that they were 60% when the polls showed that most Americans didn't want to get vaccinated. Then I bumped it up to 75 to 80% when the poll numbers started to go up. He literally said, 
I don't think Americans were ready to hear the truth. If that isn't lying, I really don't know what the definition of lying is. I mean, but this is a repeated pattern. Anthony Fauci is indicative of a larger failure of a largely left-leaning elite uh, that lacks self-awareness, frankly. I mean, to with all due respect to Stephen, you know, you can't in one breath talk about a loss of failure or a, a failure of confidence in our institutions, and then in the next breath, essentially call the Supreme Court illegitimate and say that we need a new constitution, right? You can't do the two things at the it's same time. You have uh, an American ruling class, but you are you are part of a opinion making class no. that spans. I am a Canadian. And you write for American I, I'm not a part of America at all. And, and there is a declining trust in our institutions, largely because we have an American class of rulers who has essentially given up on our institutions, who doesn't believe in the Constitution, who do, don't believe that the American system of government is legitimate, who never accepts uh, Republican presidents, right, from George Bush to, to Donald Trump as legitimate in the first place, and then complain when Republicans say that elections are illegitimate, right? This is the part of the equation that's missed when you talk about American politics. Certainly, you can point to any number of things that right-wing and Republican elites do that are worthy of condemnation. But you got to get your own house in order first, and particularly given the fact that all of America's governing institutions, with the exception sometimes of Congress and the White House, are controlled by people on the left. The left needs to look at itself and figure out what it's doing wrong uh, before it starts to sort of uh, lecture Americans in red America about what they're doing wrong. Okay, Stephen, come on my, in on that. My house is my house is Canada. I, my, my house is not the Democratic Party, which doesn't represent me in any way, either in identity terms or in political terms. Like, it's not, they're not even an enemy to me. Like, I, it, just to be clear, like, um, I, I don't want to stop you because you're really making my point for me. But, it, like, it, don't you guys think there's no point in fighting over this stuff? Like, if you both, we're all in agreement that the institutions are illegitimate. And where they where that illegitimacy comes from in the largest scale is kind of irrelevant. I mean, you know, if you're looking at it from historical terms, if you if you look at the sociology, the, like the rise of the the militias, the rise of the you know violence, and you know, just to be clear, like 94 percent of political violence in the United States comes from the right. There are left wing people who do it, but they are they're much smaller than the right. They're they're much less of a threat. And you know, you can find that research really uh, across the spectrum. Uh, you know, the reason, if you really want to go back to it, it comes from 2008 and the crash of the housing market and the failures in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the, you're right, an American elite that have, is completely not worthy of trust. Like, there's no question that that's right. But when you say get your house in order, America's your house. Like, they, that's the house you need to get in order. Not the house of the, not the other guy's party, not you, not your party. You need to get a system where even if you lose, you feel like your government is legitimate. I just, you know, Stephen Harper was my prime minister. I wrote against him. I attacked him. It got nasty sometimes, but I never for a moment felt that he was not Canadian or that he was he was not a legitimate steward of the Canadian people, right? Uh, so, you know, here is the point. When you, when you bring, when you cannot agree on did Fauci lie? It's probably not worth even debating when you don't have a framework where a real answer can emerge from. It's just more screaming. Okay, Dylan, come on in here and let me get your take on what you've just heard. I, I'm I'm more sympathetic to, to Nate on this than I, I think people might suspect. I do think there were massive messaging failures by the CDC and the FDA early in the pandemic and that that worsened trust in institutions, which I think is a pattern you see throughout American history. Uh, if you look at polls uh, asking Americans if they trust the government, the big decline happened in the wake of Vietnam and especially the Church Committee, which investigated the CIA and intelligence services and found they were doing things like secret attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro, uh, unauthorized surveillance on, on Americans at home, uh, LSD testing on unsuspecting civilians. Uh, that was bad behavior that correctly reduced America's trust in the institutions that did it. Um, but we're somewhat far afield from the question of, of how this translates into to violent conflict. And I think it's important to remember that when political scientists have, have tried to poll Americans on how sympathetic they are to violence, um, there, were, there were a few papers on this uh, this past year from a, a team at, at Stanford and a team at, at Dartmouth. Um, 
support for actual violence is incredibly low. And some of that is social desirability bias. You don't want to tell researchers that you're actually really gung-ho about violence. Um, but some of it is also about misperception. Um, there's been some research suggesting that when you give accurate information on how few of their neighbors support political violence, Americans become less likely to support political violence. And that fits with some of what we know about civil wars and other contexts. War is incredibly costly. No one rationally would want to settle a dispute over war rather than through a negotiated settlement. The costs are almost always higher. Uh, and so when war does break out, it tends to be because of a, a sort of paranoid arms race between sides where one feels like they need to, to build up on arms uh, and prepare for war because they assume the other is. And part of my worry about this discourse is that it might contribute to a sense, and I, I'm not attacking Stephen personally here. He's one writer. This is a much larger discussion in the United States that, that he's, uh, he's partaking in. Um, but I don't want the sense among Americans to be, well, a civil war is coming whether I like it or not, so I better learn how to use an AR-15 and get ready for it. My worry is that that dynamic can have a corrosive impact and might sort of exacerbate some of the very trends we're trying to uh, fight against in this discussion. Well, Dylan, you've led us nicely to where we want to go next, which is to say some people are asking right now whether America might not be better off engaging in a massive divorce. And to that end, I want to bring a map up here that is in Stephen Marsh's book that basically shows an America that would be broken up into several different countries. Let me ask our director, Sheldon this Osmond, if he can bring that up. This is, yeah. I, I, I get it. And for those who are listening on podcast and who can't see the map, let me just describe it a little bit. If we go west to east, you've got the three western states, Washington, Oregon, and California, in a new country called Cascadia. You've got, I guess, a lot of red states across the, uh, the middle of America into the new Republic of the United States. Texas, of course, has to be its own republic. So the Republic of Texas stands on its own. And then in the northeast, you've got... I, what, what are being called here the United States. And these are a lot of the blue states, um, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, New England states, uh, New York, Virginia, et cetera. And this is a potentially new map. And Stephen, I'll let you make the case that, that I guess, mm. I don't know, how, how, how much serious thought is being given to the United States separating into different countries to avert the next civil war? Well, there is a lot of new interest in secession. About 58 percent of Trump voting Republicans are in favor of secession, but also 41 percent of Biden voting Democrats at least somewhat support uh, secession. So it's it's rising. It's growing as an idea. Um, you know, that division that I had there was really about where you see not just um, the political divisions of red and blue, but also major social divisions. So church attendance, gun ownership, proximity to abortion access, uh, a whole host of corporal punishment at schools, very basic things that are really profound. And, you know, when you look at American politics, it's so easy to see both of these sides in a negative light, like that because of hyperpartisanship, because essentially it's become an attack mode, like their politics is in constant attack mode. But, you know, another way of looking at it is both of these countries have positive visions of political reality. Uh, you know, in the, in the southern United States, it would be independence. It would be a basis on traditional family and uh, community attend community participation, as well as uh, you know go government restriction from individual life. And and that's a po you know that's a positive vision. Whereas the nor the Northeast also has a positive vision of itself as a multicultural democracy with with a, a great deal of openness and um, and and freedom on a different term. So. You know, to me, you know, it's possible to see these two sides at war, but if they were separate, they could actually kind of fulfill their political destiny, which in a sense the United States has kept them from, right? Because they've because they've been trying to negotiate with each other, they haven't really been able to, you know, to achieve a full vision. Like what would a, 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 a northeastern seaboard look like with parental leave? Uh, you know, real health care, real gun control. I mean, and, and what would the, you know, what would the Southern and Midwest look like if, it, you know, it wasn't constantly trying to show, you know, deal with Washington? 
I, you know, these are really interesting political questions. I mean, unfortunately, they'll probably never be asked because secession is more or less constitutionally impossible. Uh, well, but, let's not get but, there you know, yet. I think it's worth seeing. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. We're uh, thinking that about legally the differences speaking. in a positive way. Yeah, okay. I take your point. Uh, let me find out from Julie whether she sees anything positive in that map. So I'm actually somewhat concerned about that map because a lot of the geographic sorting we see in the United States is along the urban rural divide. So if you take large geographic swaths, like say that middle section of the country, you're actually abandoning a lot of large cities and a lot of communities that could really benefit from a United States of America. So say, um, as a professor at the University of Mississippi, I know a lot of Mississippians really depend on federal aid. And if we're left in a world where we're kind of divided into red state nation versus blue state nation, what does that mean for local communities? What does that mean for red communities in these new blue areas or bluer communities in red states? So I'm actually kind of concerned that a map like that might force um, either some people to want to migrate, emigrate, or if they can't afford that, as many people who are not upper middle class, then you're stuck in this mismatch. But I also want to say in some ways we're already seeing elements of this map because of our federalism system, because we have state and local governments who are increasingly making day-to-day -day life choices. We see this in terms of mask mandates, vaccine mandates, how individual states and individual counties handle the the COVID vaccine. So in some ways, we don't necessarily need a large secession or a large redrawing of boundaries to get a lot of this. Each state kind of treats its people differently in terms of, you know, say abortion access, voting rights access, vaccine access, et cetera. Okay, Nate, I wonder whether you think there would be a lot of conservatives in the United States who would simply be able, be happier about being Americans if, for example, California were just its own country or the New England states or New York were their own country. What do you think? Well, look, in, in some ways it would make our lives easier, but that doesn't mean that we should do it. Uh, I think Stephen was absolutely right when he said earlier that um, America is our house. This is our home. This is our country. Uh, and we have a duty to preserve and protect it, right? I am not an Oregonian, I'm an American, first and foremost. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, unless Lincoln was wrong about preserving the Union during the Civil War, or unless you think that our divisions now are more significant than they were during the Civil War, where we disagreed about literally whether or not you could own human beings, uh, I think that our situation now is challenging and requires statesmanship, uh, but also is something that actually could be solved rather than by divorce or, or national secession, which I don't think would work anyways because of the urban-rural divides that were just discussed. Um, we just recommit to the American system of federalism, right? I mean, this is actually the way the American system is supposed to work. It's the genius of the American system of government is the fact that people in Mississippi don't have to live the same way as people in California. There are alternatives, and the way that we actually lower the temperature and cool things down is by dispensing with the idea that everything needs to be done at the federal government, right? Actually, the original sort of constitutional limits on the federal government and the powers enumerated in the states are the best way to solve our national divisions, to, just to basically recommit to a system in which local communities have more self-determination and the federal government has less say over our lives would be a great way to deal with this without having to deal with some really significant national divorce scenario. Well, Dylan, as I get your take on this, I guess I should point out that te Texas does have a bit of a separatist movement down there. And uh, California is easily one of the top I think it's, what, is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world already? So it's pretty obvious they could exist as their own country, as presumably could New York State. Uh, the New England states have precious little in common with the Deep South, uh, other than the fact that they're all Americans. Is, is the country, in your view, effectively divorcing already? I don't think so, in, in a way that I, I think some of the previous discussion has led up to. Um, 
as uh, Professor Ronsky said, uh, there's actually a great deal of variation from state to state on a lot of these highly contentious policy issues. Uh, low income uh, pregnant people can get abortions uh, through Medicaid in New York state. They can't in Mississippi. Uh, in New York state and California, you are not allowed to own guns with magazines holding more than 10 cartridges. Uh, in Mississippi, you can own anything short of a machine gun, basically. Uh, and one thing that's been interesting to me is is how slight those differences are, despite the fact that our federal system allows a lot more uh, variation. Uh, California does not have a single payer health care system akin to Canada's, uh, despite being well to the left of, of the American public. Uh, Mississippi is not a sort of libertarian, no government uh regime, despite being well to the right of, of uh, the American median. And I think some of that is, is that there might be less disagreement over the, the correct equilibrium than we like to think. Uh, if you look at a state like Massachusetts, it's a very liberal state by American uh, standards. They've enthusiastically elected a moderate Republican in the last two elections. Uh, same thing for Vermont, uh, one of the most yep. left-wing states in the United States. And I, I think it, it indicates that there's there's some implicit moderation in American public opinion that we might not be appreciating. That Massachusetts mm -hmm. Governor Charlie Baker, who is a moderate Republican, is not standing for re-election because he thinks he's going to be attacked from the right and therefore <laughs> will not be able to win his nomination back, despite the fact that you're quite right, he's been a popular two-term governor. Governor, uh, we're down to our last few minutes, and Stephen, I, I, I guess I should give it to you to, to address the issue of, okay, you've put the thesis out there. Do you think anything can be done short of this divorce, which I suppose... Uh, I suspect you all agree is probably not in the cards. Is there anything that can be done to avert the next civil war? Oh, you know, just to be clear, like the, the models here show that the chances of a civil war in the United States are about 70 percent. It's nothing is inevitable. I think it's also worth pointing out that America really is the great country of reinvention. It's the great country of political reinvention. It's the great country of personal reinvention. If anyone can reinvent their politics, it's the Americans. Uh, you know, they they have the creative capacity to do that in a way that no other country in the world does. Um, but what I would like to say is that the idea that this is all going to work out, that it's going to be like, this, you know, the 60s happen and then it's lava lamps and the rest of it, like disco and so on, like the 70s happen, we'll all kind of forget about it. That's not going to happen. This this is going one way, and it is re it is really a case of reinvention or fall. Like that, those are the choices, and the the questions that are facing America are the largest political questions. They are not, you know, who will get elected in 2024, who will get elected in 2028, who is going to be on the. That's it's the questions that face it are: Will violence win? Can it survive as a multicultural democracy uh, and and remain whole? Um, it, can, a, can it update a system that's in collapse, which prevents fixing the system as it collapses? That's a, you know, these, are, these are enormous questions. But you know, if there's anyone who can do it, it's the Americans. I want to thank Stephen Marsh, the author of The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future, for coming onto our program today, and our three other guests from the American Capitol who commented on his book, Julie Ronsky, the professor of political science, specializing in political psychology and American politics at the University of Mississippi, Nate Hockman, the ISI fellow at the National Review, the Novak fellow at the Fund for American Studies, and Dylan Matthews, the senior correspondent for Vox. Great to have all of you on TVO tonight. Thanks, and... Um, Let's hope there's no civil war. Can I say that? Am I allowed to be editorial and yes, say that? Indeed. Let's hope there's no civil war. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Last month, the co-chair of Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table, Staney Brown, put it bluntly when he said that, quote, COVID is an airborne disease. I think that's clear. But that hasn't always been clear. So here to help explain, in the nation's capital, we're joined by Dr. Sarah Adelman. She's an Ottawa-based physician and assistant professor of emergency medicine at the University of Ottawa. Dr. Adelman, it's good to have you on our program. How are you doing tonight? I'm good, thank you. Great to have you here. In terms of the key ways that this virus is transmitted, how is an aerosol different from a droplet? Because we've heard a lot more about the latter than the former. 
Right. So an aerosol is a very light particle um, that will remain suspended in the air. And the time of suspension and the duration of travel in the air really depends on factors such as airflow and ventilation. So this is opposed to and opposed to a droplet, which is a much um, heavier particle, which is emitted from the respiratory tract and which will fall to the ground close to the source. And it, it follows a more ballistic pathway, if you will. So to infect someone, it has to land in their mouth, nose, or eyes. And as I mentioned, it's not going to stay suspended in the air for very long. It's really, you know, when we think about our two meter rule, this is based on the idea of droplet transmission and a droplet falling close to the source. We've heard the National Medical Officer of Health, Theresa Tam, use the analogy of Omicron traveling through the air as something similar to secondhand smoke. Is that a good analogy to use? Yeah, so um, I love that analogy, and I'd say that aer aerosols are like secondhand smoke. And I think this is really easy for us to conceptualize. Um, and Dr. Tam, in fact, did use this analogy a couple of months ago, although it was first, um, I think, developed by the aerosol scientist, Dr. Lindsay Marr. So if you think about aerosols as a plume of smoke that are, again, em emitted by a person, um, you can imagine how they can linger in the air. You can imagine sort of seeing the smoke travel, that that um, uh, traveling is going to depend on factors such as airflow. And you can also imagine then that in a poorly ventilated space, uh, the aerosols are going to stay lingering in the air much longer. So similar, again, similar to smoke. And that really drives home sort of the importance of ventilation. You can imagine that when you open a window and you dilute the air, you're going to have a decrease in the amount of smoke that's in the air. Well, let me pick up on ventilation. Is it also possible then that if you have aerosol in one room, uh, a ventilation system could take it into another room and you could catch Omicron that way? So this is possible. This is um, uh, unlikely to be the most common cause of transmission. And I can briefly go through the different modes of, of tra aerosol transmission. So the first one and the most common is going to be close contact transmission, or, or, or I should say transmission at close range. So if I am emitting aerosols, or again, if you think about smoking, it's the people closest to me that are most likely to be infected, that are most likely to inhale those infectious aerosols. Uh, the second time type of transmission is what we refer to as sort of shared um, shared room air transmission. So this is really the basis for our super spreader events. And again, if you imagine sort of a bigger room with lots of people in it, um, but several people may be smoking in that room and there may be poor ventilation, then someone far away at the other end of the room may still end up inhaling that uh, those aerosols or that secondhand smoke it's still gonna be more concentrated closer to the source. So the people close by are still more likely to be infected, but people far away can be infected as well. And we saw that with the super spreader events like the, the choir in Washington state, for example. And then the third type of transmission, which is the one that you just referred to, is that sort of longer range transmission when someone's not even in the room. Um, this is harder to prove and um, certainly occurs much less, we think occurs much less frequently. Uh, but depending on airflow, it is possible. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that traditionally we thought of as more um, synonymous with airborne transmission. But what we've learned over the last uh, almost two years now is that airborne transmission really encompasses all those different types of transmission. And I presume the Omicron variant spreads more easily through aerosol than its predecessor variants. Is that right? You know, I don't think we know for sure yet. We do know that it's more contagious. I mean, we're seeing it spreading like wildfire through our communities. Um, we think at this point that that's partly based, certainly partly based on its immune evasiveness. And also it's likely inherently just more contagious. Uh, we don't know if it transmits more by aerosols than the other variants. What we do know is that all of the variants have been airborne. It just seems to be more obvious to everybody with, uh, with Omicron. Okay, let me share with you and our viewers and those listening on podcast as well. This was a tweet from the World Health Organization in March of 2020, and it said, fact, COVID-19 is not airborne. The coronavirus is mainly transmitted through droplets generated when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or speaks. And then it goes on to say what you should do to protect yourself. Now, admittedly, that tweet came in the first month of COVID-19 when presumably authorities didn't know as much as they know today, but... It does raise the question of why it may have taken so long to accept the notion that COVID-19 was airborne as opposed to droplet. 
Yes, it's a very interesting question, and there are there are definitely a lot of theories on that. Um, when we think back to July 2020, we might recall that there was a letter signed by over 200 uh, aerosol scientists, really directed to the WHO, asking that they presenting the evidence in favor of airborne transmission and really requesting that the WHO revise its its guidelines. And it's taken a long time, and we have seen a shift now in the last few months with uh, you know. The majority of all the pub the public health organizations now acknowledging air solar airborne transmission. I think there are three main um, reasons that it's taken so long. So the first one is rooted in history. So traditionally, since the early 1900s, we have equated um, transmission that occurs in close range with droplet transmission. And we do know that COVID is transmission occurs more often in close range. Um, this sort of became a, some people refer to it as dogma, but it really became the dominant model of respiratory transmission for many, many years. And even airborne diseases, um, well-established airborne diseases like tuberculosis and measles were once thought to be transmitted by droplets. So there's a historical basis for that. And there's, you know, a, a difficulty, I think, in upending the status quo. Um, you know, medicine requires a, uh, we want a lot of evidence, we want a lot of data. And in a fast moving pandemic, sometimes it's hard to gather all that. And we also, I think over the last 18 months, maybe, or at least initially, weren't necessarily having the dialogue that we should have been having with the aerosol scientists and the engineers. So it was much harder to sort of gather the evidence that we needed. And then uh, the second reason is uh, would be a supply question. So I really do think that at the onset of the pandemic, we certainly had issues with supply of respirators or N95s for healthcare workers. Um, we didn't and we still don't have enough, enough isolation rooms in hospitals. So I think supply dictated um, some of our reluctance as well to acknowledge airborne transmission. And then finally, um, I think we need to be honest that it's much harder or it can be seen as much harder to control an airborne uh, transmitted disease. The onus is really on governments and on businesses to provide safe indoor air for the public and for employees. It's a lot easier to just tell individuals to wash their hands and stay two meters apart. Having said that, if public health organizations had accepted the notion of airborne sooner, how might things have been different over the past 20 months? Yeah, I think that uh, we would have had the time to invest in the technologies that actually work to mitigate airborne transmission. And these are high quality masks, both for healthcare workers and really for the general public. Ventilation, and that includes filtration as well, just HEPA, HEPA filtration units. Um, and even something like UVGI, which is this ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, um, which is underutilized, but has been used for years to manage TB and it's been shown to be quite effective. So I think there were, once we know, accept the science, we actually know what the tools are that work to mitigate airborne transmission, but they do require um, both acknowledging airborne transmission and then investing in these technologies. Um, and unfortunately, our reluctance to acknowledge airborne transmission meant that we've had a significant delay in really um, going forward with these technologies. If we accept airborne transmission, does that mean the two meter distancing rule that we've been told to keep between us and the next closest person to us, does that mean that rule's pointless? No, it's certainly not pointless. And again, this is where the cigarette smoke analogy is useful. Um, if you're standing close to a smoker, you're going to inhale a lot more of those of that smoke or a lot more of those aerosols than if you're standing further away. So distance is still important, um, but it's not enough. The plexiglass that literally thousands of Ontario businesses have been using to separate clients from their workers or other clients from each other, are those completely useless as well? Um, so again, I wouldn't say they're completely useless. I think um, for droplet transmission, and you know, at this point, we know there's aerosol transmission. We suspect there's droplet transmission as well. So they will be useful for venting droplet transmission. Um, the problem is that I think that we have relied on them at the expense of investing in better mitigation tools, such as improved ventilation. Um, and there is some evidence from aerosol science as well that aerosols can unfortunately build up sort of in that space behind the plexiglass. So um, they can give us false reassurance, and in some cases they may actually unfortunately increase aerosol transmission. Hmm. Okay, in which case, last question here. What else, you mentioned ventilation, what else needs to be done at this stage of the game to protect people more from the aerosol as opposed to droplet transmission? 
Yeah, so I think the first thing that we need to do, which is actually free, is to disseminate this information in a very clear way to the public. I think that most people want to take the right steps to protect themselves and their families. Um, and if we can have a shared mental model, and that mental model of airborne transmission, then I think that you know there's a lot of things that individuals can still do and make to make safer choices. But I do think we need to take the onus off individuals as well and talk about what the government and what businesses need to be doing to protect um, to protect us better. So we need a more robust supply of good masks. These are respirators or N95s. These provide better protection for the person wearing the mask as well as source control. So you have fewer aerosols leaking out from the mask and so you're protecting the people around you as well. Um, you know, we have Canadian made respirators now, we need to scale this up and we need to distribute these and explain to people how to wear them and when to wear them. Um, the second, as you mentioned, technology is ventilation. And, you know, optimizing or ventilation is not something that we can do overnight. We've, we squandered a lot of time. There's still improvements that can be made. Um, but I am, you know, we have to recognize the fact that uh, this is certainly more challenging and more um, resource intensive. We can, however, improve ventilation through filtration. And you've probably heard a lot of talk recently about um, portable HEPA units or air purifiers. You know, Ontario's put these into a lot of schools. And these are really useful. Um, what they do is they filter out the aerosols in the air. So uh, they're quite effective. They need to be sized to the space. So putting a small one in a large gym is, you know, might help a little bit, but it's certainly not going to be enough. But that's another tool that we can use. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned before, there's UVGI, which is underutilized and which, um, you know, again, can't be rolled out overnight, but which is something that I, I hope that we can be looking into more and investing in more. This is unfortunately might not be the last variant and probably not the last airborne pandemic. Oh, dear. That's Dr. Sarah <laughs> Adelman joining us from the nation's capital with uh, some encouraging news and some not so encouraging news. Thanks, Dr. Adelman. Good to have you with us on TVO tonight. Thank you so much. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, January 11th, 2022. Tomorrow, is it time to end the lockdowns and learn to live with COVID-19? We'll consider that controversial proposition. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.